I am Jim Collison, and this is Gallup's Called the Coach, recorded on July 15th, 2022. Call the Coach is a resource for those who want to help others discover and use their strengths. We have Gallup experts and independent strengths coaches share tactics, insights, and strategies to help coaches maximize the talent of individuals, teams, and organizations around the world. If you're listening live, love to have you join us in our chat. There's on, there's a link right above me on our live page that'll take you to YouTube. Sign into the chat room. We'll be taking your questions live. If you're listening after the fact, we'd always love your questions that way as well. Send us an email, coaching at gallup.com. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app or right there over there on YouTube so you never miss an episode. Dean Jones is our host today. Dean is the Global Talent Development Architect and Senior Learning Expert for Gallup, as well as the Chair of Gallup's Diversity Council. And Dean, great to have you back on Call the Coach. Welcome back. It's been a while. I'm happy to be here. Uh, we are always glad to have you and uh, glad, especially this time to have you back. Give us uh, today, we, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about are you called to coach? It's a special topic for me because, of course, July also celebrates the nine-year anniversary of the very first podcast called The Coach that we did. Kind of crazy we've been doing this for nine years, right? It's nuts. It's nuts. <laughs> it's it's amazing that, that it's been that long uh, since we started this thing. Yeah, I thought, um, I, you know, we, we were talking and I was thinking about uh, what to cover today. And and what conversation to have? And it felt like uh, a great moment, given the, the given the anniversary. It felt like a great moment to go kind of go back to the beginning and talk about what does it mean to be called to coach, and what is it to have that kind of calling, and what does that mean for you? So I thought today we just kind of talk a little bit about that, and and kind of dive into that subject. That's awesome. Get us started uh, from that. I mean that that question. How did how did we come up with that? term called the coach. Yeah. So it started actually, I, some of you may remember Paul Allen. Paul worked at Gallup for a period of time. Um, Paul is the was one of the founders of Ancestry.com. And at that time, we were kind of kicking off our e-commerce business. And we were looking at all the things we needed to do to be able to support strengths in the world. And um, at that time, Paul, one of the things Paul did when he first joined Gallup was he traveled around the country and he interviewed a lot of strengths coaches around the country and really looked at what was the experience of being a strengths coach, what was fulfilling for people around that. And this was right at the very beginning, right? So as we, as we were just starting to offer classes, as we were just starting to offer strengths really online for people to be able to purchase. And the thing, when he came back, you know, um, he started to kind of debrief with a bunch of us and said, the thing that struck him the most about coaches and particularly about strengths coaches is they they all felt like they had a calling, that it wasn't just, hey, this is my job that I do or, you know, I'm, I'm good at this. It, it all felt like for them, it felt like a calling, that they had really a calling to coach. And and so that's that's where we ended up with the title of the podcast, right? Called to Coach, right? And but more even more than that, it's where we started to to realize that as we worked with coaches, that part of working with coaches was really, really understanding, respecting, supporting the kind of sense of mission that comes with strengths coaching for people. Mm -hmm. Dean, when we think of that term calling, I think it can mean different things for different people and maybe even in our context that way. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I think it's pretty simple. You know, I, I'm always the guy when I when I start out, when I re, I, I always want to understand, okay, well, what does it mean, right? And I was like, I use the Googler a little bit to, <laughs> to go like kind of look it up. The definition of calling, if you look at the dictionary definition, is a strong urge toward a particular way of life or a career. You know, again, a strong urge toward a particular way of life or a career. And it's often used in a religious context, right? Mm -hmm. So for most, for most people, they, you're, you're accustomed to hearing this, this notion of calling in a religious context, as in God's calling me to this, or God's calling me into ministry, or whatever it is, right? We talk about it in a secular context rather than a spiritual context. Although I would tell you that I think... Um, for a lot of the people we know, I, you know, Joanne Miller was uh, a coach at Gallup who uh, uh, was a nun, is a nun, 
And so we know a lot of people in the faith in faith based communities that use strength. And so it is both a uh, secular calling as well as a spiritual one. But we we think about it more of an, in kind of a secular context where we think about what is what is it that you're meant to do? What is it that you find yourself being meant to do? And, I, you know, for a lot of us that do strengths coaching, there's that sense. It's like, wow, this is what I'm designed for or this is what I'm meant to do. And so I thought we'd talk a little bit today, if it's okay, Jim, I, I thought we'd talk a little bit about how do you know if coaching or really if anything is a calling for you? How do you, how do you start to find your calling? And um, so I wanted to kind of talk about some of the attributes of that, that um, just, just from, from my experience working with people, what are the attributes around that? And how do you start to get a sense of that? Um, Go ahead, Dean. Let me let and let me just say as before you dive into that. It's, yeah, the, please. The term it was interesting. The term called to coach became even internally here at Gallup, kind of a title for a variety of things. And we yeah. tried to we tried to kind of put that on called to manage or called to lead or like, and it never really worked. It mm -hmm. never really those terms never really it didn't stick like called to coach did. That seemed like. That term was so made for, in a lot of ways, custom made for us and what we did and the way we decided to do this with media and the, in, the, in YouTube and the podcasts and the community, we just couldn't replicate that same idea. And so I really, i I have felt it's really, really this calling to coaches really tied mm -hmm. to our coaches community. And I, I it's just we tried. We tried to make it other things. And right. it, it just wouldn't. It just would never stick, right? But it stuck. It, it it stuck so well. So I'm really glad you're talking about this today because I think it brings us back to some of these original ideas we had uh, in the very beginning. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, and, and Jim, I think just to your point, I think it, when we tried to use that branding with other groups, it's because it wasn't authentic for those groups, right? I, they, you know, that those groups didn't have the same sense of calling around the work that they were doing. So anyway, so <laughs> I'm sorry. I just looked at the chat, but I said in the chat, called to manage, not quite the same thing, right? Uh, and so, yes, exactly. So it, it, it is it is that sense of, and I think this is really useful. You know, Jim, when you and I were talking about this be this session before the before we started here today, I'm going to go through some attributes, I think, of how to know if something's your calling, right? How to know if it if it really goes clunk for you. Amy Frederick said this brilliant thing in chat here today. Um, Strengths makes everything I do click. I become comfortable in my own skin. And Amy, I, I really think that that's, that's that sense. That's what it feels like to have a calling, right? It's like, oh, yeah, this is what I'm this is what I'm I'm ready to go for, right? This is what I'm designed for. This is really what I'm called to do. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go through this and 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 I think for some of you you'll use this depending on where you are you'll use this to be able to one determine if being a, a coach or a strengths coach is really what you're called to do for some of you who've been doing this for a while it just may validate your sense of your calling I hope that it's also something that you'll use with people you coach right so for those of you that are strengths coaches I I really hope this is something you'll use with them because it I I think it helps people to be able to figure out what am I, what am I designed for? Really? What am I supposed to be doing? So five attributes, I'm going to go through each one of them just a little bit. Um, just cause I think it'll be, it'll be useful. The first one is, and maybe obviously is that if it's going to be your calling, it's got to align with your talents. It's got to be something that when you look at your talent themes, when you look at your strengths, that calling should align with those talents. The place I always like to start is the five clues to talent that Don Clifton had. I think that's a great place to start. And I, I, I think, you know, in my work over the last almost 17 years with strengths, um, in my work with strengths, one of the places I always get grounded is in those five clues to talent. If you're not familiar with them, like I'm going to do a plug here, but the, there's a, the old book uh, that was written by Don Clifton um, with Paula Nelson um, Soar with Your Strengths is a great place. It was really the one of the first places this was published, those five clues to talent. Um, when Don was doing his research and, you know, as a researcher, he was really looking at how do I know if I've got a talent in a particular area? How do I, and, and really as a researcher, I think he was trying to build the criteria for how do I identify 
the presence of talent in a particular area. And he came up with five clues to talent. Um, Jim just put them in the chat, which I think is perfect. The first is, is rapid learning. Um, is it something where I pick it up quickly in that particular area? The second is when I do it, is there deep satisfaction? That huge sense of fulfillment, right? The third is, is, is it something where there's glimpses of excellence? Like right away I start doing it and all of a sudden we can see the brilliance, right? The fourth is flow, which is you kind of get in that, that's that mindset, that, that mindset of flow. I'm looking at my bookshelf for the, for the book on flow, but it, you get in that sense where there's this timelessness, you can kind of lose yourself in it. Um, and the, and the fifth is yearnings that you just have this kind of yearning to do it. I'm going to talk about that more in a minute, but you have this, you're, you're pulled into doing it. So I think that first is, is that when you're kind of you're trying to decide, hey, do I have a calling in this area? It's first is, does it align with my talent? And particularly, can I see it's an area where I seem to be learning rapidly in that area? It seems to be an area where, gosh, it's deeply satisfying. I always, you know, teaching is one of these things that I, I know I'm called to do. And I always have this incredible sense of deep satisfaction every time I teach. There's just like, it's like, oh, man. This is what I was designed for. Um, you you get those glimpses of excellence. You can see, wow, I'm good at this. And the other the other the other thing, and I often use this when I'm coaching people, is 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 one way to know do I have talent in this area or is it something I'm called to? Is do people tell you, wow, that was great? Uh, do you get that kind of feedback, like, wow, you should do more of that, or wow, it's really great when you do that? You know, when you start to hear that kind of stuff, you got you got a sense like that's. That's talent, right? Um, is there that sense of flow? And also, are you pulled to do it, right? I always think part of that, gauging that alignment is that you can see yourself doing it. This sounds like a weird thing to say, but you know, a lot of us imagine ourselves in different situations. But like in, in all practicality and all reality, you can see like, yeah, that's something I love doing. I can see myself doing it on a regular basis. And you start to also... Be clear about, as you use your talent in that area, what knowledge, skills, and experiences you'd have to add into your talent in order to have a strength in the area. So as you're thinking about, hey, should I be a coach? Am I really called to coach? One is really looking at, does it align with the talent that I've got, right? Do I, do I have that sense that it's really aligned there? Can I see myself doing it? And can I start to see the kind of knowledge I'd need to have to be successful in this area? Can I see the skills I'd have to develop, the experiences I'd need to have to really have to really be world class in that particular area? So that's really the first one aligns with your talent. Jim, anything for you on that one? Yeah, you know, it's been as you talk about that, nine years we've been doing this. And yeah. So for me, you know, I came here, I started 15 years ago as an IT manager. And that flow wasn't as good. <laughs> and this has been great, right? And yeah. so all those things match. I mean, it's for me, it's been an exercise. My, you know, my time here and what I'm doing is a perfect example of exactly what you're talking about. Right. Exactly. And I'm by the way, I don't think I'm called to be a coach. I am an interviewer. I am a facilitator. I am an MC. That's what I do. That's my thing. I work with the coaches, and many of them are surprised that I say that. But yeah. my role as a facilitator, as a community manager, is so much more different than coaching in, in a lot of ways. And so I bounce up, I bounce against that all the time. So it's great validation, Dean, as I think about this, even in my role here over the last nine years. Yeah, that's really beautiful. And and for those of you who are joining us live, I, I, I'm interested. I know I can see some of this happening in the chat already, but it's great to kind of map those things on for yourself, right? Whether you're live or if you're listening to this podcast, but really listening and saying, gosh, how does it align with my talents? It's great to ask yourself that question and to be able to really look at that. The second one is, is it consistent with your values? And I, I dug out like, gosh, it was like two years ago, three years ago that we did a podcast on strengths and values so that we did one that was specifically around values. Um, one of the things I said and one of the definitions I, I, I use for values is values are one's judgment of what's important in life, one's judgment of what's important to life. And I, I really fundamentally, I think all of us, and particularly when you work with people, when your job is really developing people or working with people, I think fundamentally 
people all should get in touch with what their values are. Fundamentally, what are those core values for you? What are the things that are most important to you? Where are you grounded? One of the things I always say about values is that values, sometimes people say, well, my va- I value my family, right? Or I value um, the project I'm working on right now, right? And your values are really beneath all that. Your values really are eternal. They don't live in time and space, right? Your values are those things that are fundamental for you um, that, that are underneath all of that. And part of, the, part of the usefulness or the value of knowing what your values are is it gives you a sense of who you are fundamentally, um, what those core values you have, and that in, when, you, when you operate in conjunction with those values, it, there's a fundamental kind of alignment that you have. There's a fundamental authenticity that you have, that you're you're operating consistent with what your values are and expressing those values in the work that you do, right? So um, that's a that's a that's a really powerful piece. How do you know if something's a calling? Is because you can see the expression of your values in it. It's a way of being express being able to express uh, your values, and it honors the expression of those values. Jim. Dean, we did that session on values, but for for folks maybe here, could you give a a one like if say I'm str- like how I'm struggling to think through like what do I value? What, yes. what how how you know what are those? We have some values cards and some things you can do, but practically yeah. speaking, how yeah. how do you advise people on that if they're thinking through like what is it that I really do value? Yeah, one of the things I always tell people, um, one of the one of the sort of time honored honored ways. Are are uh, or the exercises to start to find your values are um, it's called the five whys. It's root cause analysis is basically what it is. Is or or sometimes people call it the five why analysis, where you just ask yourself why do I value that, right? So you start with something that seems important to you, right? And then you say, you know, like okay, well, you know, my family's important to me, and 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 you ask yourself, well, why do I value that? Well, why do I value that, right? Answer that question. And then keep answering, well, with whatever the answer to that question is, well, why is it that I value that? And you keep asking the, that question to drill, start to drill down into fundamentally, you get, what happens is you sort of hit bedrock there. You know, you hit something that at its fundamental level is really important to you, right? It's like, uh, I, I have a good friend in California. Was one of the first people that I ever really had deep conversations about values with. Um, he was a consultant at the time. He's a lawyer. He was a consultant at the time, and he was doing a lot of work with his clients around values. And fundamentally, he one of his core values in life is love, and expressing love and facilitating the expression of love. Right, and it really became a hallmark of, at the time his law practice and now the work that he does. And so I think it's for all of us, we've got to kind of figure out what are those kind of core values that are at the core, at the heart of really who we are. And so that, so that how, you know, something's your calling is you can see your values being expressed there. For me, you know, one of the things, and I've shared this before, but for me, really what my whole life is about is empowering people to fulfill on the, the, their most important challenges, their most important commitments. And so really, I've spent my life really in the area of learning development. Really, I'm in the empowerment business. You know, <laughs> is really, am I empowering and equipping people to be able to do that, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's why my work with strengths, my work as a coach, my work as a teacher, my work leading um, learning at Gallup is all sort of an expression of that. Yeah, I, I love it. I think uh, I've really worked. I think that's been a work in progress for me. And is that, do you think folks have a good grasp on that? generally, or for many of us, are we always kind of working through or discovering those values, you know, in in the things that we really hold close to? What do you think? Here's the thing I, I, you know, the thing I think is hard about this is unlike, unlike identifying your talents, identifying your values is a little squishier, Mm -hmm. you know, it's a little squishier. At the end of the day, only you are the one can say, these are fundamentally my values, Mm -hmm. right? And how you oftentimes where they feel it feels like they change for people is people are in the process of figuring out fundamentally what do I value? 
And so they get something and it's like, well, I thought I valued this, but really underneath it, what I value is, you know, is that, right? So there's something that's underneath it that they really haven't gotten to. Mm -hmm. And so it's really that process. And I think it, you know, it it's part of the process of self-awareness where you really start to learn more about who you are. Um, it's really a sense of figuring out, figuring out like really what am I what am I about? Yeah, I think your drill down concept is one I'm gonna hold on to is I think because maybe those what I think have been shifting values is actually just punching through a, a, a an, an item and realizing, oh, that value is actually deeper than just this, whatever it is. It's actually farther down or deeper in the process. And it gives me some new insight into kind of who I am as a person. It may feel like my values are shifting. They may just be getting deeper, or at least the understanding of them getting deeper. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I think it's, it's um, one of the things I encourage people to do is go back and listen to that podcast. Maybe one of the things we can do is, is we'll reference that in the, in the we've got, but, um, and there's lots of people that do great work around values. So I will tell you, there's, there's lots of good work around that. Um, but I think that's, it's kind of hard to be able to say at, at, at the core, really, if you're, if you're in a conversation around what is my calling, the first thing is, is, does it align with my talent and is it consistent with my values? Those are the first kind of two, right? I think the third thing around mapping, around determining if something is your calling is, does it contribute to others? Is it something that's a contribution? Um, uh, fundamentally, if it's your calling, you, you know, the sort of the highest expression of all of us, I would assert, I would say, is that is the contribution that we're going to make in life, the difference we're going to make for others. That at our highest expression is that we're productive, right? And I would, I, I don't have evidence for this, but I would tell you that that I firmly believe that a calling is never destructive; it's always productive. You know. I don't think we're called to blow things up. <laughs> you know, I think we're called to be productive in some way. And even if your job is blowing things up, I think, you know, it's in service of something that you're building. So I think part of figuring out your calling is figuring out what your contribution is. Now, will your talents give you a, 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 some access to that? Absolutely. Will your values give you some access to that? Absolutely. But it's also getting clear, what is the thing I want to contribute with my life? What is the thing, what is the difference that I want to make? How do I want to be productive? How do I want to be a contribution? And I think for all of us, that's, again, I think that's the highest expression of who we are, is what is the difference we're going to leave on the planet? We all have a, a life that has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And the end always comes quicker than we think it's going to come. And part of figuring out your figuring out who you are in the world and figuring out your life is figuring out what difference do I want to make? And so part of sorting out your calling is to be able to say, is this what I want to contribute? Is this the difference I want to make? Do, can I see myself making my difference, that difference? And in some ways it becomes what your life becomes in service of that your life, instead of being service of your wants or your needs your life becomes in service of the contribution that you are. And so that's really the three thing, the third thing, excuse me, uh, to, to kind of inquire about if you're looking at your calling is, what do I want to contribute or how am I going to contribute to others? Okay. The fourth thing is, and, and I think this is, a, this is a real interesting one, is it should be something that you have a unique insight into. It should be something that, when you, that uh, it's a difference, but it's not necessarily a difference that everyone would make. It's the difference that you're uniquely positioned to make. It's the difference that where, where you have a unique insight or you have a unique contribution that will, that will contribute meaningfully in that area. I always think that a calling, I always think that a calling is really is something, you know, I, I'm going to use an analogy and, and this analogy has been politicized like so many things in our, in our world these days, right? But a calling oftentimes is like a dog whistle. You know, a dog whistle where they, you know, with dogs, they have this whistles. It, it's a high pitched whistle that only the dog can hear. Humans can't hear it because it's at such a high frequency. The dog can hear it, but, and the dog is like, oh, yep, this is it, right? I think that often your calling is like that in life. 
is it's like a dog whistle. It's something that you see or hear, a difference that you see could be made. Something's missing that you could contribute. Something, Something's available that other people don't see. I think that's where people, by the way, get stopped in their relationship with their calling is they say they see something and they say, wow, if only that were available, wow, the world would be different. Or if only that could be contributed, man, everything would change, right? And then they look around and there's no agreement around them for that thing. Nobody else. It's kind of like, it's like, do you see how good that would be? And everybody around is like, no, I don't, I never really even thought about that, right? But do, but do you see that that's missing? No, I didn't really even see that was missing. And people get stumped, right? It's like, it's like, oh, wow, because I don't have any agreement around this, maybe, maybe I shouldn't do this thing, or maybe it's not really necessary. No, no, no. That's the, that's, it's because that's your calling. That's not their calling, right? That's your calling. Your calling is to provide that thing that you see, that thing that you see missing, right? And that's really what a calling is about, is that you see, you uniquely, see something that is available or could be available and that you have the opportunity to go provide that. And I, I really do believe that that's the essence really of not just a calling, but of leadership is that you're somebody that you, you see something and you're called to be able to provide it. And in the beginning, by the way, part of providing it is starting to build agreement around it. Right. One of the big steps early on is, you know, when it seems like a bad idea to everybody else, you know, your job is to start to say, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had this? Wouldn't it be great if we fixed that? Wouldn't it be great if that was available, right? And to get people kind of on board with that, that would really make a difference. Dean, as we started to build out this program nine years ago, you and I had two very pivotal conversations and I'll remember these, you probably don't, but I'll remember these for the rest of my life as we, as I got agreement from you to do this kind of stuff. And, you know, nine years ago, podcasting wasn't what it is today. And we had never done anything like this before. And who is this IT guy? That's going to like, why is he asking to do this <laughs> type deal? Right. But that's a, to me, that's a perfect example of what you're talking about, about getting this agreement. It wasn't a guaranteed. Mm. Today, we look at it like, oh, yeah, it's slam dunk. That should work. Yes, yeah. of course you would do that. Not in that day. Like, there was mm -hmm. some question. Maybe we yeah. maybe we shouldn't be doing this. I had people coming to me saying, why are, I, I remember a, a customer support pinged me, like, why are you at answering questions? Like, mm -hmm. you know, what, what are you doing there? So it's not always, I love the fact that you're saying it's not always not everybody else sees it, but yeah. you do, right? You mm -hmm. see it and you have to keep, you have to keep going. <laughs> yeah. Keep, it's, right? it's part of who you are. Right. And it's, it really is, you know, in the purest sense, what you're called to do. I love Jim, what you said there. So uh, for most of my life, I followed uh, Warner Earhart who has a uh, great, great 20th century thinker, right? 20th, 21st century thinker has done more significant work around thinking and breakthroughs. One of the things that um, Werner Herr talks about when he talks about a breakthrough is, is he says <laughs> that I always think is funny. Uh, I, it's probably not intended to be funny, but I think it's funny is breakthroughs always seem obvious after they've happened, right? Right. After they've happened. Yes. Make the wheel round, you know? Yes. Make the wheel round. That's a great idea. You know, before they happen, not so obvious, right? Not so obvious. Not a lot of agreement. Yeah, somebody's but after like, the no, fact, figure eight is great. Figure eight, we should be using a figure eight. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. The figure eight right. guy that's just <laughs> rattling your cage. <laughs> really, exactly. So part of it is is really is is really after the fact, really being able to, or before the fact, being able to say, yeah, this is the right thing. So um, one is, I think that again, um, how do you know something's you're calling? Is you've got that unique insight into it. You see what is missing. One of the things that it's it's always harder to see what's missing than what's broken, right? People, lots of people will walk around saying, yeah, that's broken, right? Being able to say that this is something that's missing, that if it were available would make a difference, much, much, much more difficult, right? Last but not, not least, um, how do you know if something is your calling, right? I, 
I think, and this sounds so funny, but I think it's it's useful. Last but not least is it's it feels to you exciting and fulfilling. You know, it feels like something that is exciting for you. You're excited about that future. And you can see yourself doing it. It feels meaningful to you. That it feels like the kind of work or the kind of endeavor that would give your life meaning. It feels like a future that is worth living for. The kind of future that you you would be willing to, that, you know, that you, you're, it's worth living for. It also feels like something that that w- would call you into action, right? You're ready to jump in. You're ready to go. So the last one really is exciting and fulfilling. So here's the, I guess here's the five things. Let me recap the five things. One is it aligns with your talent. Two, it's consistent with your values. Three, it contributes to others in, in some way. Four is that you've got some sort of unique insight into what's missing and could be provided. And five, it's exciting and fulfilling for you. So those are the those are the things that I would use as you're starting to think about this as sort of a test of uh, sort of a test of hey, is this my co- calling? It is coaching my calling, right? Um, go ahead, Jim. Dean, do do you think sometimes we feel like we get we get one shot at this in our life, this mm. calling? Do you, yeah. how, how, is that, I mean, for, in your experience, you and I have been doing this for a long time. What, d- if you miss it, is it gone? <laughs> Can you come back around to it? If it didn't, if you're, maybe you're in the wrong environment and it didn't work in that environment, but it could work in another. Can, I, I always just feel for people who feel like maybe they missed the boat, right? Let me, let me answer your question in a funny way. Okay. Or in a, in a, in maybe, maybe in an indirect way, you know, so I, I I'm on Facebook I'm on Facebook and like everybody on Facebook, you know, I'm, I, I belong to a million, million groups, million crazy groups, right? Uh, obviously I belong to the strengths coach group, but so I don't know, it was maybe three or four years ago. Um, I started joining all these groups that were about retirement and people planning for retirement. And initially I was interested in kind of in the money aspect of it, right? How do you plan? So you're financially set up and all that kind of stuff. But I ended up in some groups that were people that were planning for retirement or getting retired or were retired, Right. And the interesting thing for me about it was the amount of people that were g- getting ready to retire and were absolutely miserable. I mean, like literally it was like, if you had, if you'd named the group, the most unhappy people in the world group, <laughs> right? Like, you know, people that are miserable group, right? This would be the group of people for whom that are about to retire, right? You know? All these people are miserable and all they're doing is complaining all the time. Right. And, you know, and I, I read this and I, you know, I just, I read, read all the posts, you know, about all these miserable people, right. Who are just about to retire. Right. And yeah, I, so I think it's one of those things where, and a lot of them were in jobs where they were not happy, where they felt unfulfilled, where they felt like their work wasn't appreciated. They weren't doing what they really ought to be doing in life. Right. And I think part of it is, so to answer your question, I don't think, I think that people, as people figure out their calling, I I, I guess I'm going to go out on a limb here. I, I think people have a calling. I think people, just like people have inherent talents, I think people have a calling in life. And that calling in life is something something fundamental for who they are. I think there's lots of expressions of that calling. You know, so I think as we figure out in our 20s or our 30s or our 40s, they may be different expressions, but they're expressions of the same talent. You know, they're expressions of the same calling that we've got in life. You know, it's it's this funny thing with me. Like you look at me, um, you know, when I was a kid growing up in 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 Lincoln, Nebraska, Omaha, Nebraska. Right. And all the other kids were out, you know, playing baseball because in Nebraska, that's what all little boys do. Just go play baseball, right? That's that's it. That's basically it. Nothing else, right? You do, everybody plays baseball, right? And I was like, all I wanted to do was play teacher, right? Play school. Mm-hmm. I just loved that. I just wanted that, right? Then I get to high school, and all I want to do is be a camp counselor. Mm-hmm. All through high school and college, every summer, all my friends were getting jobs and making tons more money. I was going to be a camp counselor because I love being in that environment, right? Uh, my first job out of college. I taught at a boarding school, right? At a boys' boarding school, I worked with dyslexic boys, right? So 
I, I can see in some ways, and now, you know, it's, I spent this whole, whole first part of my career in sales and marketing, and then ended up back in learning, right? So it's this funny thing. I think at some way, it's all the same thing, right? It all adds up the same way as somebody who's drawn to teaching, somebody drawn to coaching, right? And so I think that there's a calling, the kind of fundamental calling that people have, right? Yeah, sorry. Oh my God, love Dean playing school. I love it. Yeah, yeah, you do now. <laughs> it's a lot better than it was then. <laughs> um, so I think there's that fundamental calling that we all have. But I think as we go through life, we find what is the right expression of that calling, mm -hmm. right? You know, what is the right expression? I think for all of us, I think that's one of the challenges, by the way, with people starting to downshift in their careers as they move toward retirement is figuring out how do I honor the calling that I am and but it may be in a different environment at a different pace with a different audience. Right. So I, I think there's figuring all that out. Makes sense. Yeah. And I, let's narrow it down a little bit since we're, so we, you know, we kind of talked about this, this, what is a calling? Can you talk some advice on some coaching? Cause now, okay. So people are drawn yeah. to this cause they want to be a coach. And so yeah. as we, as we, as we pop in here, what, what, what do you have to teach us on that? One of the big epiphanies I had when we started building the coaching community was that we'd go out and say, hey, are you somebody that likes to coach? And and people would say, oh, yeah, I'm coached. And, and, and. But I realized as we got into it that what we were calling coaching and what a lot of coaches were calling coaching was actually kind of two different things. Right. So people would say, yeah, I'm a coach. I lead classes all the time. Now, we call that kind of teaching, but they were calling that coaching. Right. Or people would say, yeah, yeah, I'm a coach. I work in an organization and I make recommendations on how they can, you know, improve their culture all the time, right? Well, we call that a consultant. We wouldn't necessarily call that a coach, right? But in fact, the, the business of coaching, of being a coach in the world, right, you know, is really, really a blend of all those things. There's coaching, there's some teaching, there's some consulting. And we, in some of our classes, some of the courses that we've done, uh, we, we've tried to make a distinction between those things, just if only to clarify the practices around them, right? So there's peer coaching where you work, like you, our friend Jackie Merritt that all of you know, right? You know, she is probably one of the highest expressions of a, uh, of a coach, right? She does one-on-one -on -one coaching. She works with people over time and develops people. There's, you know, there's that that expression of coaching, right? A lot of strengths coaches, kind of what they do is a blend between teaching and coaching, right? So they start out and they they lead groups or they teach classes around strengths and that evolves into doing some interventions with people. And it, it may not just be one-on-one -on -one coaching, but it also may be um, um, small group coaching and that kind of thing, right? There's this quote I dug up that I thought was kind of relevant to this. Um, many of you guys know Kurt Liesfeld. When I started um, working with the learning consultants at Gallup, um, Kurt was one of the learning consultants at Gallup, and he had been coaching for about 14 years. He was the first person that took me through, um, um, at the time, was our flagship um, strengths coaching program. And Kurt passed away a number of years ago, um, but I think was one of the highest expressions of being a strengths coach, really. Uh, gifted and incredible human being. He also, by the way, his book is out. We, um, his ebook, and I and I highly encourage. He's got multiple books, but the ebook he does around theme dynamics, I think, is one of our best. So the, I'm going to read you a quote from him because I think it was really useful here. I think it was it was valuable. He um, and this comes from just by the way, um, uh, before he passed away in his last couple of years um, working at Gallup. Um, last maybe three or four years, I was his manager. I asked him at one point to write me his sort of definition of coaching. And he wrote me like a 20, 30 page document that was really for him, like everything that he had on what, what he thought about coaching. I'm just, I'm not going to read you 20, 30 pages, but I'll read you this. <laughs> I'll just read you this paragraph that he wrote from this document that I think is useful. He said, coaching certainly appears to include teaching but it also seems to transcend teaching. Coaches teach for real, as opposed to a theoretical or hypothetical performance, real time, real price, and real results. Maybe we can conclude that there's some connection and continuity between teaching 
and coaching. With teaching occurring first and focusing more on the basics and the necessary skills and knowledge, outstanding coaching is likely to be preceded by great teaching, but more focused on the actual performance and application of skill, knowledge, and talent in a real setting. In some cases, there will be those who play the role of both teacher and coach. In other cases, they may be more separate entities. And I think I love the, what he said there is that often, because in my experience, particularly with strengths, it's kind of that way. You kind of start out teaching and end up coaching, right? And that the great teaching kind of precedes the great coaching. And, you know, I think particularly with strengths, it's kind of getting people in the world of that. Now, the reason that we put this in a conversation about your calling is some people are called to teach. Some people are called to coach. Some people are called to consult. Some people have a calling that includes more of those, right? And I also think that there's room for the different expressions inside of it. So I know coaches that are really just more like teachers. They get on the phone with somebody and they're listening. They're, they're great listeners and they're great coaches, but it feels a little like teaching when they talk. I know great coaches and, and we've got a number of my gal that are, that are great consultants, that they get on on the phone with somebody and they're great listeners and they're great coaches, but they're also making great kind of proactive recommendations and really guiding people. They're really functioning like consultants. I know great coaches who are the purest expression of coaches, right? Who are great listeners and, and really are able to work with somebody so that they can lead themselves really um, uh, to, to their, to the, the fulfillment of their talents and strengths. So um, I do think there's distinctions between them. I think, you know, when you're a great teacher or a great consultant, it's more about putting something into somebody's space that they have to deal with. So when you're a great teacher, a great consultant, it's more about putting something into somebody's space that they have to kind of wrestle with and deal with. When you're a great coach, it's kind of like being a great therapist where your job's kind of taking things out of people's space so that they can move past them, right? I, I, I find that, and, and I found that, you know, the best coaches are really astute listeners. They, they are really great listeners and they, they're able to really listen not only to the content of what you're saying, but they're also able to hear what's behind it and they know how to help you kind of move past it. So, Jim, I think you want to get in here and say something. Yeah, do we? Sometimes I feel like we get stuck in the nuances of this, and then we start arguing with each other about is yeah. it or isn't it or those. Any advice around? I mean, just as we approach that as a community. Yeah. I mean, what 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 kind of advice would you have for for our coaches around that about handling those? You know, maybe somebody's consulting, but they're calling it coaching or, or you know, fill in the blank on this, whatever that conflict is. How, do, how as a community would you love to see us kind of work together on that? Well, uh, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> so first, I think the, the uh, it's probably the first principle is MYOB, mind your own business, right? <laughs> I think mostly, and I mean that sarcastically, of course, because, you know, that's who I am. But I also mean that. I mean that intentionally, like, which is that focus on really what you're doing. Mm -hmm. The first thing, rather than focusing on what they're doing, don't do, the, don't do their thing, right? Mm -hmm. You do your thing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And you do your thing the way I have to always manage myself because I grew up comparing myself to everybody. Mm -hmm. So I, I always think I should be like Jackie Merritt. I always think I should be like somebody else, right? I always think I should be more like Jim Collison, right? I, you know, like I always, you know, I'm always comparing myself to people. And the, the first principle really is mind your own business, right? Which is really pay attention to what you're doing and you run your own play. The other thing I think is, I think those distinctions between coaching and teaching and consulting, where they're, they're, they're distinctions that are designed to empower you, not disempower you, right? It's not designed to use as a weapon against someone. They're not really a coach because they do da 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 Or worse, a weapon that you use against yourself. I'm not really a coach because I'm not blah, 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 right? I think that where their, their usefulness is, is to be able to be clear about what you're doing in the moment. Is this a moment that calls for teaching? Is this a moment with this client that calls for coaching? 
Is this a moment with this client that calls for consulting? And to do the right thing in the right moment. I think in a moment sometimes that calls for consulting, if you're unwilling to answer the questions that the client has or unwilling to, to, to provide some advice, you know, then the client gets frustrated and feels thwarted in it. it. There's times in the moment where the client may say that they're ready for coaching and think they're ready for coaching, but you know that you need to teach some things to them first, right? That they really, that they've got a misunderstanding or a misappropriation of what we're doing here. And, and, and the first thing to do is to teach them. So I think you got to listen as a coach, you got to listen and decide what's, what's the right thing, what's the most appropriate thing to do. And I think those are useful distinctions for you to be able to say, this is what I'm teaching. This is what I'm coaching. This is what I'm consulting. Mm -hmm. And I know the difference between those three things. Mm -hmm. I love that, that you bring positive intent into this, because I think oftentimes we assume I mean, this is rampant on social media and email and texts that we always think that we come at them from an, from negative intention, right? They, we come at yeah. them and, and I love that. And this is a reminder I need, I think sometimes too, is to get, assume positive intent. <laughs> yeah. This, right. Assume, assume yeah. that we're doing, we're in this all to do it together, to do the right thing. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And part of being in a community is not everybody's like you. Right. And that's the joy of being in a community. And, you know, running around a community saying, hey, everybody should be more like me, that's obnoxious, right? No, that's not the point of a community. Is that we're all different and we all complement each other. And so the whole the whole game here is, is that we're all different and we're embracing that diversity and at the same time supporting each other. Do you want to... So Jim, do you want to take any questions or how do you want to do this now? Yeah, let's, let me, let me, as just, if, if you've got a, a, another couple minutes of things, I'll, okay. let's invite the community. They, there's been a lot of comments, uh, uh, drop it, which I think are important, but we'd love a few yeah. questions from you guys as well. So Dean, think about a, a couple minutes of, of maybe a little yeah. bit of a, of a, so folks have some time to put questions and put a cue in put there. Questions so in chat. See. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just share. So um, uh, one, uh, you know, so, so funny, but, um, uh, I, I've got this quote that I'd love to share. Um, I, I you know, I, I was laughing with a guy that I work with that he's a quote guy. I'm a quote guy. So, you know, we end up spending all day giving each other quotes, right? So let me give you a quote that I think is a useful quote. We're talking about call, calling. And this is from Dr. Jonas Salk. Uh, Dr. Salk said, um, to become devoted to a calling, to have a sense of responsibility and to have hopes and aspirations are all part of being human. To have no calling, no sense of responsibility, no hopes or aspirations is to be outside of life. You know, in other words, to have a calling really is at the core of who we are. So I think, and I think that's a great way of thinking about your calling. It is really that sense of responsibility you have to life and to all of it. And it gives your life purpose. It gives your life hope, it gives you aspirations, it gives your life purpose, and really is at the core of what it is to be a human being. I love that. Dean, what if I'm struggling? Like, what if I'm in a moment of hopelessness Yeah. in the sense of, or I'm I'm in a job that's not particularly fulfilling? And I've, you know, I've run down that path and I'm like, oh, I can't get, you know, I can't get out of this or I don't. Yeah. yeah. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. Because I think that I, I think that that happens. And I think that that happens. I think that's okay that that happens. And it happens frequently for people that people go through life and they come up a moment where they say, Hey, what was giving me all that juice before I I've got, I've wrung out all the juice from that. Right. And I got to figure out what's next. And I think it's going back, going back to those and kind of doing a clean sweep to be able to say, well, what are my talents? Fundamentally, who am I? right? What are my talents? What are my strengths? What are my values, right? How do I want to contribute to others, right? What are the things that I can see myself contributing and I get excited about contributing? What is most deeply fulfilling for me? And where do I feel like I've got a unique expression? I think when you, when you, when you, when you step back from all of it, and I know, Jim, you were talking about taking a week off and just having some time to reflect. I, you know, for some of us, it's, it's getting away from work and all that. Sometimes, you know, it's just going to a quiet place, right? And, and with our notebook and kind of writing those things out. But I think it's a good time to be able to step back and just listen to yourself. And I think it's a good, it's a, when you're in those moments, it's taking stock, right? Taking stock of your talents and strengths, 
taking stock of your values, taking stock of your the, your the difference that you see yourself making. Right. I love that. Justin asked a question out of the chat. He says, "How wedded are the are ICF to the concept of not going beyond coaching and into teaching and slash consulting mode?" He's he's curious. Yeah, um, Justin, this is where I am sort of a ICF heretic. Okay, <laughs> so I, I'm like an ICF rebel. Okay, because. ICF really does have kind of the purest definition of coaching. I think that's useful and I think that's good. And what they teach people and train people to do, I think is all, all good and right. It doesn't include teaching. It doesn't really include consulting. But what I find is for most strengths coaches and particularly strengths coaches that work at different levels in the organization, that most strengths coaches, a lot of strengths coaches that be, work with kind of beginning folks really have to do a ton of teaching, Right. So you just can't make it really as, you know, like as just a pure coach, you got to do some teaching in order to get people in the world of strengths. Most executive coaches, most coaches that work with senior leaders and executives can't get away from consulting, right? I, I, I watched one of Jackie Merritt's sessions from the summit, um, from the Gallup Work Summit, where she talked about executive coaching. And she talked about, you know, that where she had sort of started with that pure definition of, of coaching, but but really, you know, you get pulled into when you work with leaders, you got to do some consulting there. Right. And that's part of it. And so I do think I think that there's I think what they what they do and what they what they teach people to do, I think, is great from the from the purest, probably narrowest sense of what a coach is. And and I think that being a strengths coach, you end up kind of doing all three. Hmm. I remember a uh live coaching session that we did during a learning series and during a certain year. And we, we, and now everybody's going to ask me for the link for this. <laughs> right, exactly. We, it, the session was a little beyond, it was more consulting than it was, yeah. co than it was coaching. Right. And man, it really split the community. Like there were people yeah. coming in in the chat saying, this is not coaching. This is, you know, and others were saying, this is what I love to do. This is the way I coach. Thank right. you for showing me this way because it it's this is the way I coach. And so yeah, it that was that was a learning moment for me, Dean. I, I th yeah. to that point in time, I didn't really understand all of the nuances behind this. So thanks for I think we need to remind ourselves of some of these. ICF is a way, yeah, right? It's a methodology, and but there's other there's other ways to express this thing we call coaching, however that is, right? That's right. That's absolutely yeah. right. That's absolutely right. Um, Ricardo says um, uh, teaching uh, consulting is needed when you work with the sales report, right? It's part right. of the process, right? You, you right. want to make any comments on that? I, just that I, I, you know, as a guy who's worked with, and and I've done I've done sessions around this before, but as a guy who's worked with salespeople for a long, long time, yeah, absolutely. I think that's part of it. And I think that when you work with salespeople, you know, my, I, I, I'm always drawn to working with people that are in business development and sales. I love that. I love people. I love that uh, vocation. I love people that uh, um, are, are passionate about that. I also love the talent set that's involved in that. And to your point, I, I think that's absolutely right. You have to do some teaching. You have to do some consulting. It's kind of part of it. Right. Heather's got a great question. She says, um, how do you get clients to understand that there is a teaching aspects to strengths coaching, which is and may be necessary before the actual coaching comes into play and that they probably need to pay for it? Which is Yeah, I, I think, you know, for part of it with people, um, you, it is one of the things that you have to educate clients about before the fact to be able to say, hey, to get people in the world of this, we really need to do that. I, you know, Typically, when I've worked directly with clients, one of the first things I typically do is have them do some kind of teaching session because you just you have to start that. The, the, what you want to help clients know, and I think this is the, the benefit to clients, is the coaching gets so much more valuable and deeper and more impactful when you've done the teaching before. When you don't do the teaching before, you end up doing some of the teaching in the coaching session. So the coaching sessions are not as impactful. Right. So you want really high impact coaching. You invest in the teaching before. So the, I guess that's the way I would mm -hmm. I would position it. Mm -hmm. You know, no, I love it. I love it. Yeah. Dean, we got just a few <clears throat> minutes left and I know you kind of wanted to wrap it um, yeah. uh, on a particular subject. So why don't you do that? <clears throat> now? 
Oh, I just, you know, when, when, um, so on the, on the topic of calling and you're calling one of the, um, one of the people who's written um, just a phenomenal book around is uh, on calling on your calling in life or your purpose in life is Richard Leiter, who um, and I first I first heard about Richard's work from um, a good friend of mine who's a strengths coach, Barry Relaford, um, had talked to me about uh, about Richard Leiter's work in this book, The Power of Purpose, and um, and I you know I think he, he's a really interesting guy. He's got some incredible work and has done a lot around figuring out your calling at different parts of your life, figuring out what your purpose is, right? He tells a story that I um, I think is so incredibly powerful. You know, this is a guy who spent a lot of his time and a lot of years researching the, the notion of purpose, right? And understanding what it is to have a purpose. He, he tells a story about um, um, that the thing that created the probably the biggest impact on him in terms of understanding purpose is... Um, is um, he was leading a seminar. Um, he was leading a seminar at one point for a large group of people. And he got an urgent message that his mom was in the hospital. And so he decided, you know, after, after you know, he stopped and, you know, called to find out what was going on. And he ended up um, leaving the seminar and driving about four hours so to the hospital where he could be with his mother. And it turned out his mother was passing away, right? And he gets to the hospital and his mother is, is re really in her final hours. And he tells this incredibly touching story about, you know, sitting in the hospital bed, taking his mother into his, into his arms and talking with his mother really at the end of her life. And she, she was there and she perked up and they were able to talk. And at, at the end of the conversation, he said, um, he said, there was nothing else really to say. He said, thank you. And then his mother took her last breath and passed away. And he said in that moment that that moment really taught him more about purpose and life's purpose than it, all the research that he had done, all the study and the research that he had done. That it, he said really that at the everybody at the end of their life just wants to be told thank you, just wants to be thanked for the difference that they make. And in his work, he talks a lot about that there's three things that that he wishes or that he, he's, he's discovered that people wish they would have done more in their life. And I thought I'd share those three with you. One is to be more reflective, you know, to take more time to be reflective. The second is to be more courageous, that they'd had the courage to just be authentically themselves. And the third is, is that they had more purpose, that they're, that they really had used their life to make a difference. Right. And so I think as we all explore calling, you know, our calling and whether it's, whether you're called to coach or whether you're called to do something else, right. I think it's really thinking about what is our purpose in life? What is our contribution in life? How are we going to make a difference? Um, this really is, I think, the fundamental expression of life is for us all to figure out, okay, what are we called to do? What are those, the difference we're called to make? And then to go make that difference. Dean, that is powerful. As you shared that with me in pre-show, I was reminiscing about my own mom's passing here just a few months ago. And after after she passed, you know, people had asked me how you doing. I said fine. It's, yeah, I said everything. I did, a, you know, all the stuff I wanted to do. No regrets. Then you told me this story, and I'm like, oh, I, <laughs> <laughs> I should have done you. one more thing. Yeah, and, but yeah, how yeah. powerful that is. How like it's going to be a great reminder to me I, uh, of just that fine trying to get that final thank you in to someone who you know in that situation to say thank you because that's I think that's super important. In probably a life lesson I'm learning right now with you. So thanks for taking the time today to just share this wisdom. We've had a lot of great comments out in the chat room as well. And I think it's just a good reminder for us of why we're listening, why we're doing this thing, and, and why we've decided to uh, to do this thing we call coaching. Any final thoughts that you want to wrap it on, Dean? No, I just, you know, as you say that, I... Um... I don't know if everybody knows, but um, I had a bad accident at the end of March, right? I had a bad fall and ended up having to have emergency surgery on both legs and um, started a really long period of recovery, right? I was in the hospital for about three weeks and started a long period of recovery. And I, it, you know, and, and it sounds weird to say this. Okay. So I know that this is weird when I say it, but it's turned out to be an incredible blessing in my life. It's turned out to be this incredible, I was driving to physical therapy one morning and I realized like, I don't feel like a victim. I feel like I've been blessed. And, um, it, but it also taught me that life can change at any moment. 
right? One minute you're walking into the kitchen to get lunch and the next minute you're in the hospital. And so I hope we don't wait with people until the end of their life to say thank you. You know, I think it's a great opportunity for me anyway. It's, it's reminded me that every day I got to tell people that I care about how much I love them, right? And, and how important they are and, and how they're making a difference for me. So uh, I think it's a good reminder for all of us. I don't think I could say it any better way. Dean, thanks for coming back and doing this with us. And, and, uh, and, and thanks for healing up and doing a great job of that and, and being, <laughs> being a good patient. I think you probably were. And, uh, and we're glad that you're back doing, and I know many, many of you expressed that when I posted this in the Facebook groups a couple weeks ago, many were like, yay, Dean's back. <laughs> so, uh, appreciate it as well. Well, with that, we'll remind everyone to take full advantage of all the resources we do have available uh, now in Gallup access. We continue to upgrade and build that out. Gallup.com slash Clifton strengths and log in there. By the way, a lot of the questions that you asked me are answered there. So try there first. Uh, although I'm a pretty easy answer, so you can you can ping me too. For coaching, master coaching, or if you want to become a Gallup Certified Strengths Coach, you can always just send us an email, coaching at gallup.com. We'll get you some help um, with that. And if you want to follow all the webcasts as they're coming out, follow us on Eventbrite, gallup.eventbrite.com. Find us in the Facebook group, facebook.com slash group slash call to coach, and join us on any social platform just by searching Clifton Strengths. Thanks for coming out today. I've been encouraged, and I know you have as well because you've said so in the chat room. Thanks for joining us today. With that, we'll say goodbye, everybody.